into actually before we get started pronounce your last name for me weekend what is it weekend we end weekend weekend okay weekend yeah carl weekend okay that was the only thing okay <laughs> <laughs> Hey everybody, this episode of the Fire Sprinkler Podcast is brought to you again by the Laying It Down for Camp Bucko fundraiser. If you're listening to this and you haven't sponsored one single hose for $20 Canadian, so a buck fifty US, go on to the website firesprinklerpodcast.com, click on the link Laying It Down for Camp Bucko. We are going to break the world record for the longest stretch of inch and a half fire hose. I have the hoses now. Let's get the money to roll in and let's support a good cause. Thank you. Uh, I apologize for the delay in the episodes coming out here, but we're back. Thanks. Hey everybody, thanks for tuning into this episode of the Fire Sprinkler Podcast. I've got Carl Wiegand from Victaulic. Uh, we spent a little bit of time together last week at the AFSA conference. Uh, depending on how long it takes me to release this episode, it was last week, but it might have been a couple weeks ago. Uh, how's it going today? Good, good. It's good to talk to you. Yeah, it's good to it's good to talk to you. We were talking a little bit before we obviously hit record, getting our getting our stuff down, but, uh, we spent, uh, we spent a fair amount of time sitting at a table with, uh, our, our, our friend, Joe Meyer now, Joe, what's up? Uh, and we got talking about attic sprinklers and there's a lot of things out there with attic sprinklers, um, that I don't know about. And I'm going to use this podcast opportunity to learn like I always do about new products. Um, so today we're going to talk about attic sprinklers, probably a little bit of, uh, interstitial spaces and stuff like that, combustible concealed spaces, just because it's kind of a natural progression for that. Uh, but before we get started with that, tell me a little bit about yourself and the history of the industry. Yeah. So my name's Carl Wiega, as you said before, uh, I've been, I've been in the industry since 2009. Um, basically back in 2009, I started with NFSA and I spent four years working with them in their engineering department. And in that role, I, did a series of answering technical support questions. I was I taught you know some of the classes for NFSA, sat on some of their uh, NFPA technical committees, and then from there I moved to Globe Fire Sprinkler. Uh, with Globe is where I first got my uh, involvement with attic sprinklers and you know, the combustible concealed space sprinklers. You know while I was there, we developed a combustible concealed space product in 2015. And then we developed, you know, our two attic products in 2018 and 2019. Then uh, after that, uh, Victaulic purchased us in 2019. And so I became part of Victaulic. And as we moved over to Victaulic, I've kind of continued to help support, you know, those product lines and continue to help develop those product lines as we've done actually additional testing and gotten more listings with the attic sprinklers and the combustible concealed space sprinklers, you know, since uh, the purchase from Victaulic. Uh, also, you know, as far as other things, uh, I've been involved with a lot of NFPA committees, been involved with some U ULSTPs. Uh, so when it comes to, you know, code and standards and, and sprinkler development, uh, that's kind of the, the main portion of my wheelhouse. Okay. So most, well, I won't say most, but you have a ton of experience with combustible concealed spaces, attic stuff like that. Correct. Yeah. So, I mean, basically uh, when we first developed our combustible concealed space sprinkler. I was involved in that process. And then afterwards, you know, we of course wanted to get the message out there that it existed. So I did the rounds and spoke about that product, uh, you know, out in the field, going to your, your various NFSA, AFSA, SFBE uh, shows talking about the product. And I've done the same thing, you know, as we develop the addict product lines. And then, you know, in, in the process also, I've also, you know, worked with a lot of customers as well in, you know, helping them properly design their systems, you know, with both these product lines, you know, one of the, the, the big things with them is, you know, NFPA 13 basically says, you know, go look at the manufacturer's specific listed, uh, you know, instructions mm -hmm. for them. And for the, for the interstitial concealed space sprinklers, that's an eight page installation guide, which isn't too bad, <laughs> but it's still more than a lot of people like to look at. And then, you know, when it comes to the specially listed attic sprinklers, you know, both back-to-back -back type systems and low flow systems, the two, you know, primary systems that we use today outside of NFPA 13, uh, you know, if you're going to look at those installation instructions, that's, you know, 30 plus pages. So uh, with those products, because they are, you know, they do require additional learning and additional material outside of NFPA 13, they do become stress points uh, for customers when they are looking to, to design with them. 
So your your day to day right now is dealing with customers, tech support questions, helping with design and stuff like that, right? Yeah. So I mean, we're we're technically we're like the technical services department. Okay. Uh, we're, or the application engineering department at Victaulic. So um, one of the primary things I deal with is just general tech support questions. Uh, for me, because I am specialized in attic sprinklers and combustible concealed space sprinklers, that does become you know a large portion of that. Uh, I find myself teaching an attic class most weeks uh, <laughs> through Teams, or you know looking reviewing an attic design. You know, yesterday I was just looking at a really large. Uh, system with a big mechanical space in the center that had a whole bunch of single slope sprinklers all around the outside. And the customer hadn't really worked with those with our products before. So I was kind of walking them through like what they'd need to do for that layout. Uh, So those are those are the types of things I find myself in a lot with that. But then, you know, at the same time, um, you know, we're also involved in new product development. Uh, We're also involved in, you know, going to the trade shows and and interacting with the customers in that in that realm. And then you do doing actual in-person training as well. And then even, you know, when products are broken, we do help review those issues as well. But they can't break too often, can they? You're involved in like the legal aspect of the. No, what caused the problem? (laughs) uh, 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 So our PR process. Ah, uh, okay. The 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 bailing out process, so to speak. Well, it, it's it's more so you know seeing seeing what occurred, um, you know taking the product back, determining, you know what caused that product to fail, right? And you know, obviously some of those things are our fault, some of those things aren't, and it's kind of you know figuring out what what's going on with that. So with with your your conversations in in tech support and technical services, um. A lot of calls come in. Um, we do uh, in Canada, attic systems, dry systems, stuff like that. So a lot of combustible concealed spaces that require sprinkler. What are, co- what are the common questions that you're getting, you know, day to day, every day, somebody's calling with an attic question. Are they all similar or are people kind of like, is, is there one piece of information that if somebody takes 30 seconds from this podcast, they can at least get this important piece of information so they don't have to bug you every five minutes? So I'd say a lot of the questions that I get are more overall design type questions. Okay. Um, when, when it's gotten to the point that they are interested in using the system, because the biggest thing, you know, we were talking earlier about what the biggest issues are with these systems. And the biggest issue for me is getting people to realize that these systems are going to be effective for them. Right. Um, you know, as we mentioned before, you've got this 30 plus page installation guide. It's outside of the scope of NFPA 13, aside from NFPA 13 pointing to it, which it does now in the 2022 edition. And so people are kind of hesitant to want to get to that process. And and then when they do go to look at it, it, it's daunting looking at this really large set of installation instructions. So, you know, one of the most common questions I get is, all right, what do I do? You know, um, you know, I've decided I want to do this. What do I do? And so a lot of what I end up doing is, is walking people through it. Um, and that, that kind of, you know, so that's going to probably be the, the longer part of this conversation is just kind of talking <laughs> about what, what that process is. Sure. Um, I'd say, you know, as, as far as some simple questions, like things that we can, you know, get right off the bat, you know, when it comes to what you're going to do in your attic space, you can very easily make your decisions, um, you know, about what's going to be appropriate. And there's going to be a few things you really want to look for. Uh, the first thing is going to be how wide is your attic? Uh, the width of your attic is going to really dictate, you know, what you can actually do with it. All of these systems have, you know, maximum widths aside from NFPA 13. So, you know, you kind of really need to see, do I fall within that? Then the other big thing is what slopes do I have in my attic? You know, do my, what's the pitch of my roof? Is it three and 12, four and 12, 10 and 12? Um, those are also going to kind of dictate, you know, what type of system you can really apply in the space. And then the other big thing is, is going to be, and this is something a lot of people don't think about when they come to talk to us about these products, is what does the roof actually look like? You know, what is, where are my trusses? Are my trusses parallel to the roof? Are they perpendicular to the roof? You know, a lot of times when we're doing designs in other realms of NFPA 13, the exact location of trusses isn't really super important. It's more of, you know, are they there or not? Mm-hmm. But when it comes to positioning sprinklers in these spaces, one of the, the most important things is knowing where our trust members are, because 
it's not only going to dictate how our system goes in, but it's going to dictate sometimes if we can use the specially listed systems or not. You know, if I have significant roofs where the members are uh, not parallel to the slope in the primary gables of the roof, uh, those are not really an opportune situation for a specially listed attic sprinkler. You know, you think about uh, these sprinklers, you know, not to show a thing here, but they, they typically throw water down from a peak. And, you know, when we're lofting water for long distances, if I have a lot of members that could interfere with that spray pattern going down that roof, you know, I'm not going to be able to get water to the sides of my space. So really just, you know, that initial clarification of what I can, where I can use these different products, you know, through roof width, um, roof slope, and then the types of members and the location of members, those are really the, the, the really big things you need to be looking at when you're trying to design in these spaces. And then, you know, a lot of people when they walk in with a design or, or walk in with a partial design or walk in with a design question that they're not always initially paying attention to that are really going to very quickly kind of tell them, you know, yes, this will work. No, this won't work, um, you know, with these different applications. So <clears throat> I, I don't have a lot of experience with attic sprinklers. Um, I have some experience with obviously designing attic systems, but typically we'll go with a standard spray sprinkler. Mm -hmm. So what are the things that I want to take into consideration? Because I actually am, I mean, I'm not going to bring my drawing up and throw it on the table, but I am working on a project right now where I think attic sprinklers have the potential to be a big cost saver, both for the company and for the customer. What are the things that you're going to be looking for as a uh, as a contractor, as a even a fitter in the field, if you want to make a suggestion to switch over to attic sprinklers as opposed to those open spray to reduce your pipe installation, your labor time, stuff like that, what are sure. the what are the benefits? And is there a threshold of you have this much pressure and volume at the street versus elevation and stuff like like what kind of things come into play when you're taking a look at utilizing an attic sprinkler? So that's a there's a lot of. It's a lot to unpack to that, to that so, answer. <laughs> so I'm going to sit, I'm going to sit back for 45 minutes and let you just, uh, yeah. So I mean, <laughs> I guess as far as, you know, is it going to be worthwhile, um, to, to do this, it's, it's really going to come into play, you know, as you start to get, once your attic's more than, you know, say 15 feet wide, which is where you can kind of just throw one attic, one sprinkler on the peak and, and spray the width. Yep. And especially when you start getting into any sort of dry applications, um, those are really going to be situations where, in general, you're immediately going to start to see, you know, advantages to using the specially listed sprinklers. Why, you know, spe why specifically in the dry application? Well, because if we're in a wet application, a lot of times we can still use uh, our quick response reduction allowances in our attic spaces. Right. So it okay. can help us. It can help us have a smaller remote area. Um, there, I mean, there's there's a couple of things to uh, to address. So first of all, um, when it comes to using, you know, NFP 13 versus low flow and versus back to back, you know, we're going to tend to see different number of branch line patterns develop. So if I take an example of like a 60 foot wide space and I look at those three types of systems, you know, with a back to back system, I can accomplish that with a single line down the ridge of the roof. With a low flow system, I'm going to be able to accomplish that with three lines on the roof. Okay. But when I get to an NFP 13 system, now I'm up at five. So, right. I mean, that's that's going to be, you know, one of your, your big catalysts there, you know, one, three, five. And those are kind of your, most of your systems, I would say, fall within that general range. So one of the big things you'll see with the, you know, especially listed products is you're going to be reducing the number of branch lines you have. And, you know, obviously we know that the more branch lines I'm installing, the more labor is associated with that, the more pipe I'm purchasing. So, I mean, that's kind of a, a right off the bat one. Um, but there's a lot of other stuff as well. Um, essentially, if I'm dealing with roofs that can utilize the either the low flow or the back to back system, I'm going to be having, you know, a lot of other advantages as well. And when I talk through this normally, when I do my presentations, I usually start by kind of walking through kind of the progression of NFP 813 and how it went about addressing these applications. Because back before the 2002 edition of NFP 813, uh, NFP 813 didn't really care that much about attic spaces. Uh, essentially, it considered an attic space to be the same as any other combustible concealed space with closely spaced members. 
And it just said, okay, well, now you have a pitched roof, so you got to do your 30% design area increase for slope. But yeah. it didn't make any other design modifications to the space. And so at that point, the central back-to-back -back sprinklers had already been developed and because they were first developed in 1995. That was when the first back-to-back uh, -back sprinklers were developed by Central, which was then, you know, purchased by Tyco, now JCI. And um, those sprinklers needed more water to protect the attic space than a traditional NFPA 13 system. Right. So there was confusion about that because yeah. if we went through fire testing and we specifically went through UL listing to get this product to work and to, to have an effective design in this space. Why is this supposedly effective product not as effective as an NFPA 13 <laughs> design, which yeah. had, had not gone through any testing? Right. So essentially, uh, as a result of that, uh, UL decided to do a series of tests with standard spray sprinklers. Yeah. And through that series of tests, they did a series of six different tests um, essentially what they were trying to do is, you know, see if they could effectively lay out standard spray sprinklers uh, in an attic space to control a fire in the same way that the specially listed back-to-back -back sprinklers had. And to summarize it quickly, because, you know, I want to, I don't want to spend too much time talking about the fire test process. Uh, no, the fire test process is awesome. That's a really interesting thing. All right. So to summarize it slowly, <laughs> then... <laughs> Uh, essentially, with, with the fire testing, what we were really doing in these applications is we're looking at, you know, a pitch roof. Um, the, the testing that was done with the standard spray sprinklers was done on a 4 and 12 pitch. Okay. And they they put sprinklers essentially in, in channels, uh, 8 feet on center, 10 feet on center, typically 120, 140 in those general ranges for remote areas, essentially areas that were kind of akin to what was permitted in, in NFP 13. Um, for those applications, and then they did a fire test. So the way that we do these fire tests for these attic applications is we essentially start off by having a in the same in the same situation every time we have the exact same fire, um, and that fire is going to consist of a one foot by one foot by one foot wood crib that is put in a humidor because by putting in the humidor we can give it an exact humidity. So it burns at the exact same rate every single time. And then we put a 16 ounce pan of heptane underneath said crib. And that's what starts the fire. Uh, in some situations where you have a bigger space, they might do two cribs and, mm. and that'll give you a bigger fire. But in essence, what that allows you to do is always be burning the same fire, you know, in these concealed spaces. And anytime we're doing these, uh, these special fire tests. So is there anything when you're doing things like this and you're building, like you're, you're trying to, you create an attic space, how in depth do you go with the attic space? Is it, do you put shingle or steel roofing on it or do they just straight up create a wood structure? So the, the intent is really um, to use two by four and two by six wood truss members uh -huh. underneath. So that's, we actually use those members to create a standard wood truss and, um, the, the roof itself is is going to be a uh, three quarter inch plywood board. And okay. then they have, a, they'll put a venting system at, at the top of the roof. So you'd have like a normal vent hat. So that's so, like some of that heat and smoke can escape. So um, they still, um, they, they build an attic with it, like by going with, you said three quarter plywood or five eighths? Uh, it's typically three quarter. Yeah, three quarter. So they're doing something to create that thicker. They're not putting shingles question, let me, all that let me stuff. Pull up. Let me pull up uh 199 G real quick and check myself on that. Fact check. Wow. The fact check. That's something we don't get a lot of. We get a lot of people sending me emails and texts after the fact. Like, I think I messed up on that. And I'm like, no man, that's, that's the podcast. You're talking sprinkler. If, yeah. uh, uh, if I'm sure all the it's, answers. Look at that. It's a, uh, no, I, I missed it. Yeah. It's a uh, half inch. Okay. Half half inch. There you go. Correction. Fact check. Yeah. Fact check instantaneously. Um, yeah, so essentially what they're doing is creating a roof. I mean, you can put other, you know, you can put other material outside of the fire space, but the, the important part, um, there's a few important parts. Uh, one, you know, once this fire starts, we want to control the fire, right? So yeah, that's, we a, that's a pretty, it. it's a pretty good idea. <laughs> we want to limit the number <laughs> of sprinklers that activates. Yeah. Um, but we also, you know, want to make sure that the fire is not destroying the space too much. So 
what what's required for the the special test for the specially listed sprinklers is essentially we'll start by once we create our design we've got that fire in place um, one of the examples of a test and what they did uh, with a lot of these tests one of the more difficult tests is located close to the eave of your space directly right. between two sprinklers because sure. that's the one of the hardest areas to get it's super far from the peak even if the peak sprinklers activate they're not really going to be able to effectively spray down that far if you have uh you know more than a single row of sprinklers um so that's one of the more difficult fires plus you know as you get into those eaves all of those truss members are all located there so you're spraying through a lot of stuff so it's, it's pretty difficult um so that's kind of what one of the more difficult fires is. So I always use that one as an example when I, I talk through my presentation. Um, but they'll start the fire and then we wait and we wait for the first sprinkler to activate. And then once the first sprinkler is activated, you know, we're we're trying to demonstrate that this works in, you know, one of the more difficult applications. So we're going to go with, you know, a dry system. We're not we're not testing a wet system to start off with. We're, we're testing a dry system and we're trying to see how that works. So after the first sprinkler operates, we wait 60 more seconds to, you know, account for the worst case scenario of water delivery, water delivery in a dry system. Then, you know, from that point, let's say some other sprinklers have activated during that one minute, which I can tell you they do. It's yeah. actually one of the most nail biting portions of these fire tests because you're hoping not that many activate. Uh, because for the most part, usually that's where most of your sprinklers do activate in, in a lot of our, you know, attic tests. Um, but once once that minute's passed, any sprinklers that have operated, the water will be supplied to the system that is appropriate for all of those sprinklers. So, uh, you know, for example, in this application with this this specific fire test that you all did back in 2001, um, in that minute period, two or the minute period, two sprinklers are activated, and they were 5.6 k uprights, right? So, at that spacing, 15 gpm for each sprinkler, so 30 gpm was sent into the sprinkler system so okay and that was for the standard spray sprinklers, that was for the, that standard was the attic sprinklers. sprinklers okay attic sprinklers are going to be more water per sprinkler more water higher pressure or similar pressure depending on the type you're well using. um usually higher pressure but it depends um okay we can yeah we can i don't know if you want to jump around or this is a conversation man so yeah we, right. can jump, so, we can jump around well, yeah, whatever because so basically we're, with We'll go off topic. We'll wheel yeah, back. We're... We'll go off topic. We'll wheel back in. Don't be surprised if we start talking about you know how you, where your grandparents grew up by the end of it. That's that's sure. the joy. Sure. <laughs> so I mean, yeah, with with standard spray sprinklers, we're typically going to be spraying 15 gpm because these things are on 120 square foot spacing, which yeah. becomes one of the requirements as a result of this. But minimum minimum spacing seven psi, 15 gpm. Okay. So that's what you see when you're using standard spray sprinklers in the attic for the most part. Um, but when we're dealing with the specially listed sprinklers in the attic, you know, they're going to run anywhere, uh, sometimes 20 GPM. Um, the back-to-backs are going to run more. Uh, your, your smaller spray back-to-backs that are going the 40 feet rather than 60 feet, uh, those are going to run either 24 or 25 GPM, depending on which manufacturer you're using. And then the larger spraying back-to-backs, they're going to run typically around 38 GPM. And then when you use reliable system that has that that 70 foot spray, uh, they have a couple of applications where they're actually using a full 400 square foot remote area, and those are going to run you know up to 40 GPM to make sure you get that 0.1 density. Get that uh, water like everywhere. So the 70 square foot or the 70 linear feet, you're talking one row of sprinklers up at the peak. 70 feet width of a building yeah it throws 35 feet either side and all all of the back-to-backs from every manufacturer are all capable of at least throwing 30 right yeah wow so when you're taking into account the width of a building is it the edge because i i've seen a couple things but i just a little bit of clarification are you going right to the end of the eaves or where do you take that measurement from it's the open space Okay, it's the open so, space essentially. So most of the time, um, we usually see insulation on the floor. So usually it's where the top of that insulation meets the bottom of the members on the side. And I do actually talk about that in my class a mm -hmm. lot too, because that is something that a lot of times when you're looking at your drawings, 
and it's something I see whenever I, you know, whenever I'm working with customers too, when you're looking at your drawings, you don't see that. And a lot of times your attic can be about three feet narrower on each side than it looks like it is. Sure. And that, yeah. So that might not sound like a lot, but if you're, if you're protecting a six foot narrower space than your competitor is, that can be very helpful for you, um, you know, for a layout of the system mm. and can make the system cheaper to install. So if they have, and it's got to be, I'm assuming it's got to be non-combustible insulation, which most installations that you're using nowadays is non-combustible insulation. But if you are using a combustible insulation, do you have to go right to the edge of the peak uh, or just not allowed? <laughs> um, so right now, you know, you, cause you're talking about like a, a foam, a spray yeah. foam type of yeah. right? Yep. So right now when it comes to any of these spaces, and this is a, a continuing conversation that we have, um, with, you know, as manufacturers with UL is there is no, and there's no testing process that has really been done with foam. You can't test for um, absolutely everything. Well, we just, we just haven't done it yet. And there hasn't been any, um, there hasn't been any test procedure, um, that anyone's come up with to do it. And it, it's, it is a problem because a lot of people are starting to use it because it's really easy to install. Um, but foam foam presents several problems. Okay. So, and we're off topic from our other topic, and we'll get back <laughs> there, I guess. But since uh. we're talking about it, let's talk about foam for a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, foam presents several problems. Problem number one is it's foam. And some of that foam is flammable. Some of it's limited flammability. Some of it you can put a coating over to remove its flammability. Some of it's supposedly not flammable. There's a variety of different foams that are available. But um, the, the concern is, is, well, one, if it's one of the ones where you have to put a coating over it to cause it to you know work in that space, how is that any different than if I have combustible wood and I put a you know a non-combustible type paint over that wood? That's you know, right. We don't allow that. Why would we allow this as an alternative? Um, the other issue with foam, too, is even the, the non-combustible and limited combustible type foams, uh, there is concern that they could still drip. So if the foam, you know, does start to heat up and it liquefies a little bit and it drips into a remote section, now I might have another fire, right? I might have a, a fire starting in another space on the floor. And now instead of protecting against one fire, I'm protecting against two. And then the third thing with foam is, you know, no one sprays foam in evenly. Uh, you know, when you look at what the ceiling looks like after foam has been sprayed into it, it looks, you know, like, a, like I'm looking at the ocean and the waves are kind of, you know, going, going past there. And, you know, for, for standard spray sprinklers, having, you know, a difference in ceiling height of a few inches here or there, um, you know, probably not that big of a deal. But when you're dealing with a lot of these specialty sprinklers, combustible concealed space sprinklers or attic sprinklers that aren't being located directly under the peak, a lot of these sprinklers have a very tight tolerance, you know, for where they need to be with regards to the bottom of members, the bottom of the roof, so yeah. if you have, you know, a, a height difference on that slope or that flat that can, you know, change six inches, sometimes more, you're going to, you're going to affect that spray pattern and you're going to affect the ability of that product to properly spray in that space. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of concern there, even if the foam itself is perfectly fine, realistically to have, you know, effectively installed foam for these products, you really have to kind of contour it to make sure that it was still shaped appropriately for the space. Now on the floor, which is kind of what we were going with originally, but you don't usually see this foam on the floor. Usually yeah. these foams are kind of sprayed between the members on the roof. So that's why, Yeah. I guess on the floor, we wouldn't have all those concerns, but there's still, there's still concern for how it behaves in these spaces. And so if you look at any of our installation instructions, you, you're gonna see when you, if you control F and look for foam, you're going to see foam has not been evaluated with this this system. So while that doesn't say no, you can't use it. It doesn't say you can. Um, so ah, I'm just going to... typical typical NFPA uh, cover your ass type of verbiage in the in the installation, right? Yeah, uh, we're not saying how to do it. We're not saying you can't well, do it. Yeah, we're we just... just say it's it has not been evaluated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah and if you ask, if you call in and ask, because I do get that question. Uh, I'm going to tell you that it has not been evaluated, so we don't know that it will perform the same way. 
that being said, you know, with a lot of the the way that those foams look on those ceilings afterwards, I can definitely tell you the heat and the water is not going to necessarily the, the heat's not going to move in the same exact patterns where we were expecting and the water's not necessarily going to spray in the exact pattern we were expecting. So without, you know, without contouring, even if all things else were fine, um, I wouldn't necessarily be comfortable, you know, saying that that was acceptable. Did I lose you? All that means is it's been a half an hour and my camera kicks off and it has to be restarted. Oh, okay. We're still good. Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> so uh, getting into the different type of architectural aspects of attic sprinkler design, uh, you know, the, you know, the peak is obviously has a sprinkler so, design for it. The eve. Before we do that though, do you want to go? Cause we kind of jumped out of the, the first. Sure. Part. Yeah. <laughs> you want Absolutely. To. <laughs> <laughs> because i mean it, the, one of the big topics is you know why do i want to use these right yes there we go. i already know how to use nfpa 13 so yep. right and that was where i was going initially not to drag your your podcast back no please but, i this is what i need i need some yeah i was i was trying to we started with that first question and then we just yeah. kept diverting so i guess where i was going initially with the the first question when you were talking about you know the differences and why i would use the specially listed sprinklers versus nfp 13 it's there's two primary reasons uh, essentially nfpa 13 when you know when it's looking at a remote area it's not specifically trying to triangulate in on what the most probable sprinklers activating are Okay. Um, it specifically says, all right, I'm going to have a big rectangle, right? And well, a big square fire, essentially. And yeah. in order to account for the fact that that big square fire might be a little bit more rectangular in one direction than the other, <laughs> I'm going to extend the width of my fire a little bit longer along the length of my branch line. And I'm just going to make a giant rectangle. Yeah. And it doesn't really account for, you know, what type of roof structure is over that giant rectangle. It doesn't account for how the heat might move over that giant rectangle. And in most applications, that's fairly effective, right? Fire goes up, hits the roof, spreads out, heat spreads out along the roof, sprinklers over the fire source activate. We have our nice big rectangle, even though most of the time it's only three sprinklers of said rectangle, it's still an effective consideration for a remote area. Right. You know, when we're in a attic space, that's not how heat moves. Um, most of our attic spaces, Members are two feet on center mm -hmm. and we're dealing with a slope roof. So what we end up seeing is that heat goes up to that roof, goes between two members or maybe between a few members and then channels up to our peak. And then once it goes up to the peak, then the heat rolls along the peak. So rather than having a traditional rectangle that we would have for NFP 13, what we tend to see is a path up to the ridge and then heat movement along the ridge. So, when we consider our remote area for any of the specialty listed systems, that's what we account for. Okay. We look at two sprinklers off of the ridge, which are essentially the two sprinklers that are on either side of where that fire came from, if it didn't start on the peak. And then the rest of our sprinklers in our remote area are sprinklers along the ridge. So we're specifically including the sprinklers that will activate in the event of the fire. So do all your attic like you 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 were talking earlier about like a 35 40 sorry a, a 30 to 35 foot discharge from the peak down you don't necessarily need to have sprinklers down at the <clears throat> no, down at the bottom no. right correct, correct at the eve level correct yeah in that case you know so let's say we didn't have sprinklers down at the bottom then we wouldn't include them though sure. typically what we run into in those areas is there is a hip at some point Yes. So in that case, we say, okay, the fire started in the hip area, hit two sprinklers on the way up the hip, and then went into the ridge. So okay. in, instead of having the two sprinklers from the lower part of the gable, you'd have two sprinklers, you know, two additional sprinklers from the hip being included there. Remote area. And that's, that's our remote area for most of our applications when we're in these designs. How many sprinklers are you including in it? It depends. Depends um, on the type of structure like the the hip the you know val I, the one thing i haven't seen in any data sheets is anything talking about valleys so do you treat a valley like a wall correct okay so essentially with a valley uh you know heat likes to travel up so what we tend to see is you know if, if there's a fire on one side of the valley 
the sprinklers on the other side of the valley are probably not going to be that useful in, yeah. in helping that fire be put out. So we basically treat them as walls. We do not allow sprinklers to spray from one side of the valley to the other because unless that valley space is completely consumed with, with fire, we're not really going to be seeing that fire, you know, coming up the other side. Right. Um, so, I mean, to, to kind of continue on with what you were saying before with the remote areas, most of it's going to really depend on, on a few things. One, um, you know, what system am I using? Is it a single directional application? Is it a back-to-back -back application? Is it a low flow application? And then is it wet or dry? Um, so basically, if it's, let's say it's a back-to-back -back system and there's secondary sprinklers, in a wet application, you have five sprinklers on the ridge, two sprinklers either in the hip or in the in the valley area, or not valley, the hip or the, or the eave area. Um, two, those would be the two sprinklers that are close to where that fire started. Uh, if it's a dry system, you have those same two sprinklers and then seven sprinklers on the ridge. Then okay. if it's a, a single directional system, same thing. It would be two in that hip or adjacent space and then five on the ridge for a wet. Uh, and then two in that adjacent space and seven on the ridge for a dry. And then for a low flow, uh, instead of it'll be two on, on that lower space and then five on the ridge for a wet and then two in that lower adjacent space and six on the ridge for a dry. For dry systems, when you're using, when you're going down the hip, going down towards the eaves along a hip, mm -hmm. uh, are, are guys installing that low and piping up or are they typically going with a low point on the end of those? Uh, both. Both? Okay. So it, and it depends too. So in wet systems, one of the nice advantages with the specially listed systems is with wet systems, you can use CPVC and you oh. can use you can use exposed CPVC. Um, but exposed CPVC doesn't always mean fully exposed CPVC. Mm -hmm. So in the ridges, you can have your CPVC, you know, under the under the sprinklers as long as they're within six inches to the side of the sprinkler. So like yep. if you're if you're offsetting your sprinkler from your pipe, you can offset six inches. Uh, your first sprinkler off your riser has to be within one foot of it. Um, but when you're in your hips, um, one of the big concerns that you all had in hip areas is there's just a lot of extra elements, right? There's sure. all these yeah, yeah, yeah. just jack trusses and partial trusses <laughs> and you know whatever else going on. So in those areas, you're only allowed to protect the pipe that's directly under the sprinkler. So you mentioned you know going up from the floor versus you know going in at the height of the ceiling. Um, in wet systems using CPVC, you will always be coming in from the floor. You cover you cover the CPVC with insulation, six inches high, uh, minimum foot to either side or in a channel, six inches high, and then you sprig up to your individual sprinkler. So CPVC, okay. it's always going to be on the floor in the hips. Uh, with steel, it really depends on what people want to run. Um, I've seen people doing like loop systems around the outsides of their attic to get their remote hip. I've seen people running on the floor. Um, you know, again, it's really going to be dependent on what works best for, for your hydraulic calc or what works best for what you're used to doing. Um, depending on the contractor, I've seen them doing different things. I think, especially for the low flow systems, I think a lot of times running a ridge line um, and then running a low loop around the outside and then hitting all the sprinklers on the secondary lines from the low loop and then hitting the, the far hip from the low loop can be very effective. Um, it allows you to, you know, have a smaller overall branch line, allows you to, you know, more quickly deliver water to that remote connection with two, two pathways and all that. Um, but I've seen a variety of designs and I usually try and stop my explanation of what people should be doing after I've told them where the sprinklers need to go. <laughs> You're not getting involved in the entire design process. You'll just yeah, I mean, we. I, I want to make sure the sprinklers are installed correctly, and for CPVC, the CPVC is obviously installed correctly. But as far as you know, pipe goes, honestly, the people who are laying out pipe have done it a lot more than me as well. Um, so you know, if they know what's going to work well for that building to give them the best friction loss for that application, you know, it's not it's not necessarily always the same thing. Uh, and you know, they might have multiple risers as well. So I mean, there's there's different things that come into play depending on what they're specifically trying to do um, with those applications. Is there any kind of limitations as far as square footage is concerned? 
with an attic sprinkler? Like, do you, is it still the 52,000 square feet? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's still a light hazard. Um, yeah. you know, okay. a combustible concealed space, NFPA 13 calls that a light hazard. So, I mean, it would still have those same light hazard limitations. Um, you know, being that a lot of these are dry systems, that's not really going to be your limitation. It's going to be more, you know, your piping volume. Supply. Yeah. Um, yeah. one thing, one thing I'll say too, you know, we were talking, now that we're talking about piping volume, that t tends to be another advantage with the specially listed sprinklers is, you know, if we start eliminating branch lines and reducing branch line size, you know, that's going to allow us to have a smaller volume system, which might make, you know, a system in an area work in a bigger space without having to go to a second dry valve. Um, but that usually, you know, tends to be our limitations is the fact that, you know, we're up in this space where we've lost a bit of our pressure, you know, getting here. So the water's not, you know, delivering as strong as it would as if it was on the first floor. And then also, you know, we've got all this piping going all over the place. And, you know, when we're trying to get to that remote inspector's test connection, going through a bunch of small piping that's jumping all over the place, that makes it more difficult as well. So if anything, you know, we're not really going to be seeing, you know, 52,000 square foot attics, I don't think with, at least with a dry <laughs> system, um, you know, fair. we're probably, we're probably going to be shooting more for, you know, that, that 750 gallon mark. So yeah. we can, you know, squeak by with an FPA 13 allowances there. That's fair. Uh, Carl, I feel like this is possibly a multiple episode topic. Uh, I've got, two pages of notes based off when you see me looking down and scribbling notes. This is like I said, this podcast, I get more benefit at it than I'm sure all my listeners. Thank you everybody for listening. I'm sure you're all getting a lot out of it as well. Uh, but you know, I started this podcast so I could talk to the people in the industry, you know, the smartest people in the industry um, based off this conversation. I think that puts you in that category. Thank you for all of your assistance and help with it. And, uh, and I think we're going to have to have multiple more conversations down the road in regard to interstitial sprinklers, attic sprinklers, design parameters and things like that. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it looks like we really, <laughs> we probably should have focused in on one part. <laughs> uh, you know what? I, I think that every single time and I do every single, every single podcast that I do, it starts out with, these are what, these are the things we're going to talk about. This is what we're going to talk about. And then we end up just going sidetrack and just talking because that's the joy. That's the joy of this podcast is it's not, we're just talking sprinkler. These are the same conversations we'd be having. If I, you know, if we were at that conference sitting at the, uh, sitting at the lunch table with Joe, having these conversations, right. This is similar. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I like guess think anyways. Yeah. If there's one thing I really want to like drive home for people to think about, you know, with these systems. And I mentioned the, the one thing, the one big advantage, uh, you know, being that we, we do specifically use the sprinklers in a remote area. Uh, this, these sprinklers are also specifically designed to be used in these types of applications. Um, when you're dealing with an attic space, I mentioned the heat runs up the roof. So you're really dealing with a space where there's very fast heat movement parallel to the slope and very slow heat movement perpendicular to the slope. So when it comes to sprinklers that are effective for these types of spaces, you want a very rectangular spray pattern and you want it to be very much throwing down the slope and not throwing across the width of the slope. Because essentially if we leave too much space between sprinklers perpendicular to the slope, we'll allow the fire to burn without sprinklers operating. Uh, it creates and a so, lot of obstructions with those structural members. Correct. And with an NFPA 13 product, those sprinklers like to be in square spaces. Mm -hmm. So if we take a, a, a square peg and put it in a rectangular hole, you know, we significantly reduce the effectiveness of those products. So, I mean, that's, those things are really what makes these systems a lot more effective in these spaces is we're able to still get really large protection areas per sprinkler while spacing them effectively so they can still quickly activate and still be able to control that fire by very much, you know, reducing our spaces into narrow rectangles that can throw very far parallel to the slope and not as far perpendicular to the slope. And that's, that's really what, uh, you know, brings these systems far and above you know, the NFP 13 counterparts. And then when it comes to the effectiveness of the products that we were starting off with in the very, very beginning, when I was talking about that fire test, <laughs> where I was going with that is when NF, when, when uh, UL did those series of tests, they were not able to really replicate what we are requiring for a, a past test. Um, all of the specially listed sprinklers on the market today, every single fire test that they went through 
they were not permitted to burn more than a six square foot hole through that half inch plywood. And that's why I looked up what size it was, but they weren't allowed to burn more than a six square foot hole through that half inch plywood after the result of the test. And that's after we waited the, the time period for the first sprinklers to operate, the one minute for the sprinklers to actually get water to them, and then 30 minutes additional after that for a light hazard design, right? Because light hazard is a 30 minute design. Yep. Well, those NFPA 13 sprinklers in that same time period burned holes that were between 30 and 150 square feet in, in volume. And still <laughs> so, permissible by NFPA. Well, no, NFPA 13 did provide some reductions after that. So if you look at the 2002 edition, that's where okay. that four and 12 pitch clarification came into play. So that's where you're reduced to your 120 square feet per sprinkler. That's where you're reduced to eight feet perpendicular to the slope, but up to 10 feet if you do that 20 PSI. Sure. The 10 feet with the 20 PSI exists because they're like, well, we're not really going to control the fire that well, so let's put more water on it. So <laughs> that's why that exists. If anyone yeah. ever complains about spacing sprinklers perpendicular to the slope 10 feet and you're wondering, you know, why do you have to do 20 PSI? That's that's putting a lot more water on it because the fire is going to be a lot bigger by the time those sprinklers operate. That's oh boy. that's why that's there. But so essentially, that's one of the, the big things I always like to drive home is, you know, we really designed a system that's intended to significantly reduce overall you know loss during the fire and allow the building to get back into service and you know at a much quicker rate of speed and you know we didn't have time to talk about any the hydraulic advantages or design advantages or baseline reduction advantages but that stuff is just all you know icing on the cake that'll be episode two featuring carl <laughs> <laughs> carl thanks for coming on the podcast and talking about this uh anything else that you want to fit into this uh jam-packed information um just thank you for letting me on uh, and also you know if you guys do want to learn more about these products as well i i'm more than happy to talk with you directly about them i you know i teach a lot of these classes on a fairly regular basis you might find me at your local uh nfsa afsa but i also uh, i also do you know do online classes as well so i'd be more than happy to reach out and, and speak with people uh, on these topics Awesome. Carl, thanks again for coming on and uh, dumping this information. We'll talk again soon. Awesome. Thank you for having me. Hey, everybody. I wanted to take a second to thank everybody for supporting the Fire Sprinkler Podcast over the past five years. This has been an absolute ride to be able to travel the amount that I've traveled, to talk to the people that I've talked to, to be able to get the information in this industry out there and essentially um, help create a new wave of, of content for fire protection so uh, just a huge thank you to everybody for supporting i hope you're still enjoying it anybody who's still listening thank you